Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. And this is one of a series of programs in which I interview people about issues that concern the Vermont legal system. I'm very happy to tell you that my guest today is Dr. Catherine Antley. Dr. Antley uh, has offices in South Burlington, and she's been very much involved in efforts to limit the use of marijuana, particularly by young people. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It really is. Um, I read recently that um, more than 90% of adults who have a substance abuse disorder begin smoking, drinking, or using drugs before the age of 18. Is that your understanding? That's what I hear from Mariah Sanderson uh, and the prevention who are our experts in that area. So yes, that's, that's a true statement. And it's actually <clears throat> foundational to a lot of the prevention work, uh, successful prevention work in Vermont and in uh, the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And has the Vermont Department of Health done a lot to try to delay the age of first use of drugs? Sure, that's, that's uh, if you delay your first use, as the first statement implies, you'll decrease the number of people who eventually get caught up in use disorder. Um, so it, it's a proven method to decrease the pain and suffering which substance misuse produces in our society. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I've read recently that the Vermont THC cap is 60%. Is that correct? Our, our commercialization law, which was passed, um, has a flower um, limit of 30% and a concentrate limit of 60%. And that's a little bit like putting a speed limit on the highway of 250 miles per hour. It's great. It's better than having no speed limit. <laughs> Quite honestly, it is, which is what we have in Colorado and uh, almost every, I don't, I think we were the first in the nation um, to put a, a THC cap, so that's a good thing. Um, but it's, it's astronomically high and it's quite dangerous from a physiological standpoint. I should have said earlier, and THC stands for, let me see if I can get this right, tetrahydrocannabinoid? That's correct. It's one of almost 450 um, components in cannabis and when Colorado legalized, they legalized the entire plant. So all of those known and unknown components were legalized. And they're just now starting to discover some others, which are um, psychoactive and potentially um, also dangerous. Um, but THC is understood. Right now, THC is the thing that people focus on and, and is and measured. And that's the thing that makes people high? Makes people high. Well. <clears throat> You've mentioned Colorado, I think. I think there's been a fair amount written about Colorado because Colorado was the first state, I believe, to really start to promote the use of marijuana legally. Is that right? Right. It was first uh, legalized in Colorado. And recently, there's been um, really a two-year movement in Colorado. People have been organizing and working on educating legislators, especially um, about issues around THC for the last two years. And recently, in the last few months, last month, um, they were able to pass legislation which capped, which is aimed at eventually capping uh, their THC levels and, and decreasing youth access to, to marijuana. Um, if you want, I can sort of frame it a little bit in the context hey, of Hey, you're the expert. Do it. So the first uh, video clip I have is from Dr. Chris Rogers. Mm -hmm. And he's the medical director of one of the largest, the largest, um, I believe, non-publicly owned uh, psychiatric facility. Um, so in Colorado. In Colorado, mm -hmm. and so he sort of frames the the issue that he's seen, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about why Vermonters um, tend to have a low perception of harm of marijuana, and sort of con compare and contrast um, this, um, you know, information. That, that Dr. Chris Rogers is giving us versus what, what many Vermonters um, see. And then we'll hear from the Attorney General in Colorado. So we'll have the medical perspective and the legal perspective, who also is alarmed at the increase in youth use. And, um, and, and, then, and then again, compare that to 
you know, our community in Vermont and how we're sort of responding to But your to understanding is that the perception uh, in, in Vermont is that it's uh, the use of marijuana is, it's not harmful. That's right. There's you know, I, when I was presiding in court one day in, in Vermont, I had a status conference of a case where a guy was driving under the influence of marijuana on a highway at 90 miles an hour going the wrong way. And uh, he crashed into another car and killed five kids. And his THC content in his blood was like six times the legal limit in Colorado. Right. He's just stoned. Right. Well, that's a that's a um, that's an it's a unique experience in in some ways, and it's very emblematic in other ways. There was um, that person um, apparently suffered from psychiatric issues, which presumably you know, followed his high THC use, which was reportedly chronic. He had presented himself to the ER twice and was discharged. So you have this sort of interface between the acute impairment, which contributed obviously to the deaths of those 14s, but also the psychiatric issues that he was suffering from mm -hmm. um, that contributed. And I think that's a good example of the confusion, you know, around cannabis. Um, what, what, why, why are we saying cannabis now instead of marijuana? Do you understand that? When we first started, you know, marijuana was generally accepted to, con you know, it, it was the word that people used to describe the drug that people get high, and cannabis was used to describe other things oh. or anything else or everything associated with, with the plant. Um, now, um, there's a move towards using cannabis for everything. I, I'm sort of neutral on this. I, mm -hmm. you know, cannabis is technically fine. I, um, I think that, I, I, you know, I think I think that that's, uh, and I, I, you know, I think that when you listen to Sir Robin Murray, for example, who's uh, an expert in cannabis-induced um, psychosis and schizophrenia, he uses the word cannabis, and he also says in the same breath that all teens, you know, it's common knowledge in in UK that that cannabis causes is contributing factor to psychosis and schizophrenia. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But um, that the word is cannabis. Okay. So there's, you know, it's not a clean, in my, in my, it's not a clean word. It's, it's not, it's not a word that connotes this is, this is medicine or good for all things like the, mm -hmm. the 15, you know, lists of things that people um, say that it's useful for. <laughs> um, it, I, it's, and I think it's, it's, it's the correct um, word. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. happy to use that word. So this is, like I said, Dr. Chris Rogers. He's in charge of the largest uh, non-public uh, psychiatric facility. I think it's important to listen to what he has to say, you know, all these years after they've legalized. I'm the medical director of Child and Adolescent Services at the Medical Center of Aurora, the largest non-publicly owned psychiatric hospital in the state. Here I'm an inpatient psychiatrist with a front row seat to the emerging epidemic of cannabis abuse and addiction that threatens to swallow the lives of a whole generation of Coloradans. On our adult inpatient unit, it's hard to keep count of the number of psychotic and suicidal patients that are admitted with THC on board. And regardless of the data or clear evidence of how cannabis contributes to their illness, person after person refuses to accept that marijuana could be bad for them. How could it be? They have been taught to believe this is a harmless plant, a medicine that is good for anything from headaches to cancer to anxiety. It's natural, without side effects, without risk of addiction. This is the lie that is ruining the lives of far too many people in our state. The story on our adolescent unit is even more tragic, as we repeatedly treat kids too psychotic to know what's real, who they can trust, or where they are. The rates of adolescent psychosis have grown steadily since legalization, and in almost every single case is linked to the use of high THC potency concentrates. Products known as dabs, or wax, or shatter that are made in the lab by distilling down the most psychoactive component of the marijuana plant concentrated it into what is better described as a hard drug than the weed people voted for in Amendment 64. Kids as young as 11 or 12 are using blow torches and glass rigs to use to smoke these highly addictive and harmful chemicals, sometimes every night just to go to sleep. We have very little research to try and understand what this does to the developing brain, but as any child psychiatrist who treats these kids can tell you, we don't need a randomized control trial to see how dangerous and often tragic the effects are. 
We do know there's a clear risk between developing depression or even committing suicide related to earlier age of first use, as well as the potency of products. This means a 12-year-old trying a marijuana concentrate is at far greater risk of developing a mood disorder or even eventually killing themselves than a 30-year-old experimenting with a joint of flour. Unfortunately, it's far too easy for these 12-year-olds to get access to these products, and not from the black market or a shady drug dealer. They're getting them from friends at school or older siblings, many of whom have medical marijuana cards themselves and ready access to as much shattered dab or wax as they could ever want. It's time for this to change. House Bill 1317 will provide stronger safeguards to keeping cannabis products out of the hands of Colorado's kids. Having reasonable limits on daily purchases of these highly addictive substances makes good sense. Maintaining adequate guidelines for providers to uphold when recommending cannabis, especially to young, brain, or young kids, is a no-brainer. We need a more robust tracking mechanism to better understand who is using medical cannabis products, how much, and in what form. And Colorado should be leading the way in researching high-potency THC products. We certainly are leading the way in their sales. We have a long way to go to help the kids in my hospital, but House Bill 1317 is a great place to start. The whole country is watching Colorado as other states look to legalize cannabis. Let's lead the country into a sustainable and responsible future we can all be proud of. Thank you. So that's Dr. Chris Rogers, and it, I mean, that's a very powerful statement. Um, he's talking about the kids in his, um, in his hospital and how sick they are, and not just children, but also not just teens, but also adults who come in, and they often have this idea there's nothing wrong and they don't understand why they're ill. Mm -hmm. Another person I think is really important to listen to from that same um, is um, the Colorado Attorney General. Hmm. He also testified. Um, and I think it's important that we you know, hear both from, from law and from um, medicine. As has been discussed, the rise in teenage use of high THC concentration marijuana is a critical public health challenge. It demands action. And it's important what's being done today. It is a model for the nation. Just consider the latest report from the Colorado Department of Health, Public Health and Environment in their Healthy Kids Colorado survey. They surveyed the use of dabbing, which has been discussed, a way of accessing high THC potency. It went from 4.3% of students in 2015 to over 20% 20 in 2019. This is an alarming rise, and this House Bill 1317 represents an important and a critical response to this threat. The Substance Abuse Trend and Response Task Force, which I chair, and Matt Bach is with me today, head of our Office of Community Engagement, and is the vice chair, has focused on this issue with leadership from parents, from public health advocates, identifying this troubling trend. This legislation meets that trend and addresses the fact that our medical marijuana laws have enabled teen access to high potency marijuana. As we in Colorado work to address this public health challenge and refine the regulatory program for overseeing legal cannabis, we need to do so in a way that protects kids. So um, what he's saying there is that teen use has teen use of this high THC dabs, which they use a blowtorch to use and whatnot, um, has increased from 4.8 um, almost 5 percent to 20 percent, and surely 20 percent of teenagers. 20 percent, as I understand it, 50 percent of teens who use marijuana use high potency. So a much higher percentage of the of the teens who are using High, using marijuana at all or using this high potency, and that's got something to do with why they're having the high ER um, rates. And if so they, they go to an emergency room for treatment of psychosis. Right, and we're seeing that in Vermont too. And so I want to talk a little bit about why Vermonters have this inappropriately low perception of harm um, of oh, cannabis use. Please, please, and, please do. And and what is the um, you know impact on our policy in Vermont and also misuse rates and youth use rates? Um, so so for example, um, one thing that we're seeing is that 
in the ERs in Vermont, we're having a high, a lot of, of children, you know, adolescents are showing up in the ERs, very high, to the point that they've had repeated sort of, you know, consideration in the legislature um, of the issue, and it's been in the newspapers as well. Um, there are a number of articles um, talking about this, mm -hmm. but we couldn't find any media coverage of the link between the high, you know, teen ER usage um, and its psychiatric usage and marijuana. However, when we looked at the testimony of what the legislature doors were hearing, um, this is an example of one that they heard um, that's in response to a specific hearing about this. Mm -hmm. And this is from a child psychiatrist. Um, I spent last weekend on call in the ER department, talking to kids, talking to adults, and I have observed over my time on call that a significant portion of young people who are hospitalized psychiatrically or come to the ER department are heavy cannabis users. And we also know that cannabis that is used today, which can be 20, 30, 40 percent THC, is nowhere near what it was in the 1960s. And the research is that this, there is a significant psychiatric risk for a whole host of problems, most notably psychosis, but I think also suicide and aggression. And this is becoming increasingly recognized at the same time that the public perception of harm is going in exactly the opposite direction. And so I am really hoping that people will pay attention to this because it would really impose a really large burden on our mental health and substance abuse treatment system moving forward. So this, this is, is, a, is a, this is a physician who's testifying in the Vermont legislature. This is word for word what the legislators are hearing. But, that but I'm just saying, who's the source? Who's the saying? The source it? is um, it's a psychiatrist, a okay. respected child psychiatrist in the state of Vermont, you know, who was asked as an authority to testify to the legislature's towards on this topic. You know, we have. A crisis. That's how it's it's framed in the newspapers. We have a crisis in Vermont. Mm -hmm. You know, um, parents are at their wits' end. Um, the average wait time is many many hours, and some mm -hmm. going into days of in, in an emergency room before the, yes before the, the the teens or children are able to be mm -hmm. be seen or or get an inpatient bed. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, they're next to all of the trauma that is associated with an ER. You know, mm -hmm. someone comes in with a heart attack, a bleeding ulcer, you know, trauma from a, a, mm -hmm. a car, a car um, accident. So they're subjected to all of that while they're waiting. And, and they're suicidal or they're psychotic. And, and a psychosis is a medical emergency by definition. Um, or it was according to whoever admitted these children. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we looked at the our newspapers because newspapers affect what the mm -hmm. per, what the public sees as a perception of harm, and um, you know we saw these three articles. We read, read through them. No mention of cannabis-induced psychosis um, or that cannabis may be a contributing factor to suicidality, which apparently was mentioned in the in the car, um, the five teens and the driver of the the the, the, the truck in that case. Um, so that's one big piece of why Vermonters don't have an appropriate perception of harm. Um, and I just wanted to put this up, which is a diagram from a, a well-respected um, researcher in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And he's showing that as marijuana, as cannabis use increases, your psychosis rates increase, and so does schizophrenia. And there's a very large article out this week, actually, which is very powerful. It shows actually is actually associated with millions of of, um, of people in Denmark, and they're showing the same trend. And up above, you see the cannabis use is increasing at the at the same time in the youth. And this just is an important reminder that in Vermont, we have a significant increase on our um, our our surveys that we conduct as well, showing that teen use of marijuana is going up significantly. Mm -hmm. And these two, this is decriminalization, this is legalization. So we're on an upward trend here. And this I think is important for people to understand is that marijuana use in the past month, Vermont's number one in the country. And you know that... Per, you I'm sorry, you mean number one per capita in Marijuana years? use in the past month. Uh -huh. 
um, Oregon is number two and Vermont is number one. And, you know, it's, it's at least conceivable that our, the messaging that we're getting in the media um, mm -hmm. and in general is associated, maybe from industry, I don't know, indirectly, or online, is associated with that uh, increased use. And this is what you um, talked about, 90% of people with a substance use problem began smoking, drinking, or using drugs by the age 18. And so it's no, and then this one, um, these, it, the substances are not siloed. Um, they, if you are um, using marijuana, you're three times as likely to be addicted to opiates and, and whatnot. That's from the CDC. And then, of course, that leads into illicit drug use, all drug use in Vermont, where again, we're number one. So, you know, our, the state of urgency in Vermont is actually pretty high. We have ERs which are flooded with adolescents, parents with, who are frantic, um, newspapers who say this is a crisis, and the authorities in psychiatry and, and pediatrics are testifying to the legislature saying there's a connection here between our high marijuana use in our youth and, and, and in our young adults in general and in this morbidity that, or morta you know, morbidity, admission to the ER, that we're seeing um, in Vermont. And I just wanted to show this because there's a lot of uh, messaging that marijuana is going to help decrease our opiate use and there's mm -hmm. a lot of anecdotal information but we haven't seen Colorado or California the overdose rate continues to climb actually it climbs quite significantly um, so it hasn't helped um, and then this is an article which is a peer-reviewed article a very good article which shows um, adolescent use between 17, 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019, adolescent use significantly increased, you know, after legalization. And so why did we in Vermont, you know, legalize when we have potentially all this more, all these health issues that we knew might crop mm -hmm. up and which are to some extent cropping up? Well, it was for the um, criminal justice and racial justice issues. But if we look at that carefully, um, there's a new study out of UVM that says, you know, legalization of cannabis has not narrowed um, the increased rate at which BIPOC drivers are stopped compared to white drivers. And the study finds that legalization of cannabis did a little to narrow um, black and Latinx search uh, rate, rate disparities with white drivers. Um, and the UCLA, I mean, AC, ACLU, sorry, um, came out with a similar study. So we're seeing that in Vermont, that this intervention, the intervention of legalizing cannabis in order to promote racial justice, hasn't, hasn't um, delivered on that promise. Mm -hmm. And this is just a graphic, um, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which you can see that in, this is Washington, D.C., after they legalized marijuana between 2015 and 16, the arrests of minority as went up. In fact, there's a representative from Montpelier, I believe, Mary Hooper, I think, who actually voted against legalization on one of the votes. And her explanation of her um, vote, which I'm doing from memory, so I might not have it exactly right, but she was referencing this data. And she said, if we legalize, we will have more use. Mm -hmm. And as we have more use, all specters will use, will, all parts of our, our population will use more. And therefore, based on the data, we'll have more arrests of minority members. That's not something that I want, and therefore I vote against. That's a paraphrase. You, you can go to the you know, internet and, and find her exact quote. But I think she was right on with that. Here's from the, from the um, health department. After decrim only, we saw a significant increase in people who earned less than $25,000 a year and uh, less than a high school education. So we're not helping our, you know, disadvantaged, um, uh, struggling um, community. I just want to ask you, because we have some, have some kind of a time limit, is it possible that, that um, the Cannabis Control Board could limit the amount of THC in substances that are being sold legally? Yes. Um, I don't know, actually. I, I, think, I think they could. I know that we have the one limits, you know, that I mentioned there, but... Um, I think that's something that if people were concerned about the psychosis ending up in the ERs, they could call the governor's office and ask for, you know, 
a physician or public health representatives on the Cannabis Control Board to put forward that idea so that what our policy is, is based on science. Um, because, you know, in the United States, what's happening around cannabis is we're having a change in policy around a drug, which normally would go through the FDA, the EPA, the um, and we're asking ordinary people, citizens, to make these determinations. And yet we're not having, you know, uh, we're not having messaging from our media which reflects what's, what the science is really out there. So, for example, this quote from Bo Kilmer, we had one of our, our um, media newspapers of record refuse to print this. And all it says is commercial cannabis industry must focus on creating and maintaining heavy users. Dependence is good th for the bottom line. Our free speech doctrine makes it very dis difficult to restrict advertising and marketing. And that's from Bo Kilmer of the RAND report, um, you know, a quote from his uh, Senate Finance Committee. But we didn't get any of that in the media. And I think that contributes to our, our um, decreased perception of harm. And um, this is something from Jonathan Hawkins, which I think is also really important, that, that the public understand that this industry is really not interested in someone who uses casually. Eighty percent of their profit comes from people who have a use disorder or dependency. Or well, who use it daily? Who use it daily and sometimes astronomically, all day, every day, high potency. That's where their profit center is. That's why they want high potency THC. They need high potency THC for their profit. And this is a very uh, interesting quote from Jonathan Hawkins talking about this in the past, but he was, he saw the future. He said already 80% of sales are daily, um, are near daily users. Half of all the sales are to people with a substance use disorder. Uh, occasional users who make up the majority of pot customers account for only a modest share of the sales, but may provide political cover for an industry that gets rich supplying people who struggle. The I damage... Think, I think we've really run out of time. That's a good place to stop, actually. That last, last thing you just said. The damage according... <laughs> he says the damage according to our uh, public health will be substantial. And, you know, I have um, more examples of well, you got messaging that's... Well, we're just going to have to have you back and do another <laughs> show. I want to thank you all for looking in. This is a very serious subject. And I think that the more information, such as what Catherine's put out here, it's got to be broadcasted. So broadcast it to your friends, to your family. It's very important, very important to help our children. Thank you for looking in. Bye-bye.